Hi, good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to our normal Friday HIV and TB meeting. Uh, today, again, broadcast live from the Family Medicine Department here at CMH. So I'm sitting here in front of a full meeting of doctors. And as usual, this will be recorded and will be available on the Worcester Family Medicine um, and Rural Health Department site. And also look out for all the previous topics that has been um, saved and recorded on that site. Um, so normally we um, look at specific areas and topics and cases within HIV medicine, but today I'm actually going to focus on an approach to advanced HIV disease. Um, and actually, if you think about it, we, we, it's, almost, it's almost sad that we still have to do a presentation on advanced HIV disease, because with the medicines that we have and with the diagnostic tools that we have, in theory, if we're able to diagnose people who are diagnosed with HIV early and we put them on treatment, we should never see advanced HIV disease. Um, and the fact that we still have a lot of patients that are being looked after that are really, really ill with HIV has to do with the fact that our systems and our programs are not yet um, providing full access. So, so much so that the HIV Clinician Society last year actually brought out a guideline, and this is very worthwhile reading, um, it's called the South African HIV Clinician Society Clinical Guidelines for Hospitalized Adults with Advanced HIV Disease. And you can see there it came out in 2022. Um, and the way they did the guideline is a bit different than normal guidelines, which is sort of a conglomeration of lots of evidence. What they've done is, is they've asked experts to compile each of the different chapters to look at, for example, an approach to meningitis or an approach to respiratory tract infections or an approach to, to diarrhea. And we're going to touch on quite a few of these. So obviously there's no ways we can carry the, you know, cover the whole guideline. And so I'm gonna sort of give an overview of how you approach those, those very sick patients that come in. So we're gonna have a case patient that we're gonna follow through. It's Monday in the outpatient department. And we've got Mr. J, he's 27 years old. He's been brought in by his family. He weighs 48 kilograms and they've wheeled him in on the wheelchair. You know, it's those people have been getting iller and iller and iller. And finally they're so ill that they can't protest anymore. And then the family loads him in the car and, and brings him. Um, and he's basically complaining of a week. He's, he's very weak. He's got a dry cough. There's no night sweats. There might be occasional fevers. He's got some intermittent diarrhea every now and then. And the family's worried because he's not eating properly. Um, and he's very apathetic in the consultation. As a matter of fact, the family are the ones who are actually giving you most of the history. And when you take a little bit of history, you discover that he took ARVs before in 2018 or 2019 in Cape Town, and it was a tablet once daily. And we see that quite often now with advanced HIV disease. So in, in the early days when we used to treat HIV, a lot of these people were undiagnosed when they came in. Now the majority of people we see have actually been diagnosed with HIV somewhere along the line and might even have had ARVs somewhere along the line and has defaulted. So quite a lot of them has had ARV exposure. And all you can find on the system is a CD4 count of four months ago of 42. So this is a very common presentation. Somebody who comes in, you can see they're ill. You know they've got HIV. You've already got a whole lot of things you're suspicious about. Um, and what makes these patients so tricky is that that low CD4 count means they're not making any inflammation. And so they're not localizing symptoms to a clear system. They don't come in with a nice clear, oh my gosh, look, this is a pneumonia or this is a meningitis. It also means our diagnostic tests don't work so well. So we know with TB, because they're not making inflammation, they're not making cavities, they're not coughing up a cili. And so maybe your gene expert might come back negative even when they have TB in the lungs. The other problem is, is that there's quite often more than one diagnosis. So for patients who are HIV negative, we have a general rule. It's unlikely that somebody's going to suddenly present with two completely unrelated illnesses at the same time. It's usually going to come in as one illness or an illness package. But in HIV, with advanced HIV disease, they quite often have a lot of things that goes on. And one of the biggest risks I see with these patients is you start investigating and you find something and you go, oh, look, he's got TB. And we put him on TB treatment and we send him home. And then two weeks later, he dies from something else. And then the big worry with these patients is, and especially these guys that are so weak, they suddenly now get brought in sort of almost at the end stage is that while we're working them up and while we're trying to figure out what after they die, and quite often we don't even know what exact illness killed them. So we don't actually have that much time to try and figure out what's wrong with them. So our approach today is going to look at how we're systematically going to work through the systems and what we're going to look for. 
Um, and to keep in mind is that it's a bit like if you want to know what you're looking for, you need to have one of these old fashioned CD4 maps. I call them old fashioned. We used to have, that was one of our bread and butters. Um, the old days of HIV, any patient who came in, your CD4 count will tell you what you were looking for. And remember those days, we used to wait till the CD4 was under 200 before we even started treatment. So we saw very late, late disease. Um, and you would therefore decide, depending on your CD4 count, what you need to include in your differentials. So that's always a useful tool to go back to um, when you've got those very low CD4 counts. So in terms of your approach, firstly, there's some things that are easy to diagnose, and that's why we look for them first, and they're also more common. But of course, gene expert is great. It comes back positive, perfect. We've got TB, no problems. Hepatitis, easy enough to diagnose on a blood test. If they've got a seizure or they've got focal neurology, a CT scan will quickly tell you whether there's something in the brain. And sometimes you're lucky and there's a nice clear localizing, you know, nice clear pneumonia on that x-ray, but a nice proper infection on the skin, got proper Kaposi, very easy and quick to diagnose. You've got a lymphoma, you can easily FNA. So there are some things that we quite often diagnose first just because they're easy to find. But where it gets tricky is when that CD4 count drops under 200 and you start seeing things that either don't present typically um, or you start seeing some weird and wonderful. So one of our biggest challenges, and we're going to talk about that, is our gene expert negative TBs. So now you start having your extrapulmonary TBs, you've got your TBMs who don't present nice and typically, you've got your TB lymphadenopathies. And now you start getting bacterial infections, but they don't present like usual. So if there's a pneumonia, but it's an atypical pneumonia. They've got skin infections, but you don't, they don't fit into any of the ones that you know. They've got chronic diarrhea. So all those ones on red, we're actually going to talk about a bit more today. Um, and you can start having things like salmonella bacteremia. So instead of just having a normal bit of dysentery, you now actually have a systemic infestation. And now we also start seeing those atypical fungal infections you never see in HIV negative patients. So if you were working in a hospital in Europe or the USA, you would never see cryptococcus or PCP, for example, where we actually all have at some stage seen some of these more uncommon ones. And we'll talk a bit today about cryptosporidiosis and isosporidiasis, some of our common diarrheal infections. Um, so these all now get added into your differential as, you, as you're going along. And then if that CD4 count is under 75, now all you need to know is there's some very weird things in there. And it's not possible for you to actually know the full scope of all the stuff somebody can get with a very low CD4 count. So you have to have a high index of suspicion. If, you're, if your rash is really not recognizable or it's not responding to treatment, you want to be able to get a specialist involved because they might have a pseudomonas pneumonia. They might have some very strange fungal infections that is systemic, so histoplasmosis or aspergillosis. How are you going to diagnose it on a, on a really bad looking x ray? CMV, retinitis, not so difficult to diagnose. CMV colitis, very difficult to diagnose if they got CMV of the gut. MAC, so your mycobacterium avium complexes can have a very sort of abdominal gut picture with anemia and very sick looking disseminated TB patient, but actually they've got um, non, non tuberculosis mycobacteria. And you can get things like parvoviruses of the bone marrows. There's not so much that you have to know all of these. You just have to have a, a realization, okay, I don't know what's going on. I need to ask uh, one of our great ID specialists. And then, of course, in any patient who is losing weight, you've got to think about cancer. And our HIV patients are more likely to get certain cancers. So they're more likely to get cancers like cervical cancer that we see in our normal population, for example, as well, which is why we screen them more often. Um, they have specific cancers that is very specific, like your disseminated Kaposi's. And remember with Kaposi's, 15% of them might have no skin lesions. So all you're going to see is somebody just like our patient losing weight with a bit of diarrhea. Um, lymphoma, especially non-Hodgkin's, is much more common in our HIV positive patients. And then all your cancers like lung, colon, breast, you're going to see more frequently in HIV patients. So this is all in your workup. You can see your little differential diagnosis package is quite, is quite large. And this is in a very young patient. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a system by system approach. And before we're gonna go through the systematic, just make sure you don't miss your patient with severe sepsis. So remember these guys are not presenting typically. So if that guy is in there, just look out for particular um, sort of red flags. If they've got fever, especially in HIV patients where they don't really tend to make fevers, if they've got any confusion, if they're very tachypneic or very hypertensive, or there's other signs of organ failure, there might be a massive septicemia that's sitting on top of everything else. 
um, and you might you will admit those patients and start them on broad spectrum antibiotics while you're working them up. But otherwise, uh, if you don't find any of those red flags, we're going to work through the systems. And the, what we're looking for is we're basically trying to first find the most common things, then the more dangerous things, and then all the other things we might need to keep into consideration. So the respiratory system, I think you guys are, this is quite, this is sort of the easy bread and butter stuff, right? We've done our gene expert. And if the gene expert negative, we've done our x-rays. So that part, I think everybody feels very comfortable with. And if you're lucky, you might see a nice classic picture on your x-ray. Always remember to do your laterals on your x-rays because lymph adenopathy is sometimes the only sign and that can give you a clue. Um, but if they've got a productive cough, so say they're coming in and they've got a bit of fever and they're actually coughing up lots of gunk and it might even be a pneumonia on that x-ray or very nonspecific, send those sputum MCNSs early. We're in such a habit of sending, um, sending for our, our gene experts. And we quite often will only do MCNSs and HIV negative patients if they fail on their treatment for the pneumonia. But if you've got somebody with HIV with a very low CD4 count and they're coughing up gunk, it might not be your typical strep or whatever. So they might have a staph, for example, they might have a pseudomonas pneumonia. So send your gene expert and send another bottle for that MCNS. And remember, in any patient with HIV and a pleural effusion or ascites, that's assumed TB, even before you get the results back of your, of your effusion. And especially if you've drawn, that, um, drew, uh, drawn your little sample and it goes a bit loopy, so you can see there's lots of protein in it, so we know it's an exudate, that's basically indicative of, of TB. So you don't have to wait for your results to confirm. And it's very satisfying. If a gene expert comes back and the gene expert's positive, it can tell us whether there's rift resistance or not. But actually with a pleural effusion, there's not always bacilli that's going to be picked up by that gene expert. So you're not going to wait for that results to confirm that you want to put this patient on TB treatment. So HIV pleural effusion equals, equals TB, and you're going to start them on some, on some treatment. When you send that fluid away, send for gene expert and send for TB culture. So there's not many bacilli and it will be very good to have, you know, six weeks down the line to be able to pick up if there's resistant TB, for example. So even though you're going to start treatment, still, still send those so on samples. But what we sometimes see is patients who come in and they thin and they waste it and they quite short of breath. And when you do the SATs, the SATs are quite low. Um, and of course, COVID, we all quite COVID aware these days, but the big thing we mustn't forget is our PCP. So we used to call it pneumocystis carinia pneumonia, um, and then they've changed the classification of it. So it's now actually called pneumocystis gerovecci pneumonia. So PJP, depending on, on which text you are following. Um, and in anybody with a low CD4 count, or if they've got existing lung disease, so quite often these guys have defaulted their HIV treatment has also defaulted their Bactrim. So if they're not on Bactrim, they might very well be presenting with a PJP. And what normally happens is that you look at the patient, it's looking very short of breath, and you listen to the chest, and it doesn't sound that bad. And you do the x-ray, and if you're lucky, you might see a bit of a reticular nodular pattern. Uh, but it's very, it doesn't look nearly as dramatic as in comparison with the SATs. And that's almost our best way to diagnose PJP. And interestingly, it's also one of the ways um, that something that we see with COVID quite often, that the picture is not nearly as bad. Well, in the old days of COVID, hey, things have seems to have changed. Um, but we used to have these very bad lung pictures, but then the x-rays were not so dramatic. So hopefully you've done your COVID antigen and that's been negative. And in these patients, we don't have the possibility to go now and do cultures for PJP. To be able to do that, you'd have to do like a scope and take some actual bronco alveolar samples. And so it's a clinical diagnosis. Sometimes you'll have patients where it very much looks like TB or they've got TB symptoms and they've got this low SATs going on short of breath. And it's very possible that if you've got TB of the lungs and a low CD4 count, that you'll have PJP on top of that. So it's very acceptable to sometimes throw the book at patients. It's sometimes just not possible to take a calculated guess. You're going to go, I'm going to put them on TB treatment and I'm going to start them on treatment um, for their PJP. Great. So Mr. J's gene expert was taken at the clinic already and they've sent him to us because that gene expert is now negative. You do a gene expert, and you know those oh, this X-ray, you know those X-rays, it's very nonspecific. It's like maybe there's something, maybe there's not, you're not so sure. 
So I would like to know, um, oh, and we do have some people on the call, so I'm going to do a little poll here for, but I would just like to know from the group here, um, oh, no, that done both questions. Mm -hmm. See, I'm just trying to launch the poll. Oh, just ignore question number two. Sorry, guys. Question number one, would you start TB treatment on this patient today? So 27-year-old who is... Um, Got a CD4 count of ooh, 42, loss of weight, chronically ill, gene expert negative. Who would start TB treatment today? Yeah, these people are tempted. Yeah, one's tempted, right? But we could probably do a few more things um, to start treatment on this patient today. because we've not yet excluded so at the moment we don't have enough to tell us it's definitely tb it could be quite a few different things but we've just certainly not excluded tb and what i want to look at next is a little bit the workup of the gene expert negative patient x-rays unhelpful in this guy what do we do next so we still suspected of tb yeah so what is our next test you could see it thank you right so now there's a few other things we can do on the day to try and see whether this patient might have TB. And it's just to update you guys, for those of you that haven't seen this, actually already February 21, that's already two years ago. Good grief, the time flies. Um, they've updated the criteria for the TB lamb. So remember the TB lamb, interestingly enough, is one of the very few tests that are more useful in HIV positive patients. You know, most of our tests don't work so well once you've got HIV. This is one of the very few that does. And we do think it's got something to do possibly with their kidneys being more damaged, um, some people always, or some of the specialists also think maybe actually there's more renal TB and what we're actually pick, picking up is disseminated TB in the kidneys themselves, which you don't really see in your HIV negative patients. And so the reason why we don't do them in HIV negative patients is because it's a waste of money. Okay, it doesn't tell us anything. It's always negative. So the question is, is in which patients might it be helpful? And we don't, we want to save a bit of money. And so the, the guidelines have changed basically to try and make help because the lamb is such an easy test to do to give us a fairly good broad uh, range of people we can check and just exclude those ones where it definitely won't be helpful and you'll notice that there's different criteria for in and out patients so in an inpatient scenario they actually say that any HIV positive patient you can do a TB lamb on so if you're admitting a patient to internal medicine um, and they're just very sick it doesn't matter if you're suspecting TB doesn't matter what the CD4 count is doing. It doesn't matter if they've got advanced HIV disease. You admit them to orthopedics. You want to do a TB lamb on them, you can do that. Um, and we were chatting to pediatrics the other day. The pediatric guys quite like doing that capturing and just doing a routine TB lamb on any sick HIV positive child that's admitted. In an outpatient setting, they do have a few criteria. Again, you have to be HIV positive. And then we would say, okay, you need to have some suspicion of TB. The CD4 needs to be under 200. So notice it's not under 100 anymore. Or they have a patient who've got advanced HIV disease, regardless of CD4 count, or if you don't know the CD4 count. So in all of those patients, you will do those, those TB lambs and they, they're cheap and easily, easily available. So Mr. J here has a negative TB lamb. Um, have any of you done TB lambs in this room? I would hope so. Yeah, yeah. So you all will know as well that when it's negative, it can almost look faintly positive. So the idea is if you're not sure and you think, is there a faint line and it's negative? There has to be definitely something you can see and your colleague agrees on you can see. If you're having a debate or a holding it up to the light, then that's definitely a negative. And there's actually a card now that, that you can compare against. And they actually make a point about that, even on the negative card, that it can, if, it, if it looks like there's something there, then, then you can do that. So great, so now we can still do some blood tests, okay? So I'm gonna give you a limited amount of money. I'm gonna ask that you can do four tests. Some of you have heard me ask this before, I'm sure. So which four blood tests did we request for? And a full blood count does not count because that's got three tests in it at least. Which four tests would we like to do? It's not diagnostic of TB, but will help us with our suspicion of TB. I'm just asking from the floor here. People can put things in the chat if they wanted to participate. Great, CRP. So very important. CRP helps tell us about how much inflammation there is. Again, if your patient's got no CD4 count, the CRP might not be very helpful, but if it's very high, that's, that's certainly helpful. Just a note, please don't do ESRs. I don't know why anybody does ESRs anymore. 
They're often high in HIV patients anyway. It makes them very non-specific. They're a pain because you have to get them to the lab within a certain amount of hours, et cetera, et cetera. So CRP is preferential and please don't do both. That's a complete waste of money. Anything else you would like to do? Ooh, it's too many choices, hey. Which tests would you choose? The most obvious one, what is what does get affected and everybody with TB? HB. HB, thank you, well done, brave people. Okay, so you definitely wanna do a hemoglobin. So say you've got somebody who's got a cough and the HB comes back as 14. And you're gonna go, oh, okay, we'll watch a little bit more and we'll try for a few other things. If the HP is low, especially if there's a normal cystic anemia, or especially if there's pancytopenias, you're getting very suspicious of TB. So pancytopenia in a patient with HIV, we would start on TB treatment first. Um, and if they don't respond, then you might go the, the bone marrow route, but quite often that's caused by the TB. We're gonna do a CRP, not an ESR. And then the other tip or the trick we can do, especially if you're in the district hospital setting, is you want to see as a, as a, as a sort of a marker, not a very good marker, for um, lymphadenopathy in the abdomen or TB actually growing onto the abdomen, you can do your ALP and your gamma GT, which will be an obstructive picture on your liver function test. So it shows that there's something actually pressing on that liver. Um, and none of this tells you whether there's TB, but they already start giving you a bit of clue. It's like things that you put into the mix. While you're there, you also want to make sure, can't I get a sample from somewhere? So if you have any abnormalities on the LFT, you definitely want to try and get an ultrasound, which we can do in the CMH setting. As you guys know, we're quite keen for all interns and young doctors to learn the skills of being able to do an ultrasound in their setting, wherever they are. So we would like you guys to be able to do an ultrasound in a district hospital setting and be able to look at least for splenic microabscesses or, or basic signs of TB of the abdomen. You might not have access to that in a district hospital, and then you might have to rely on those blood results. If there's a gland you get a needle in, please do send um, some an FNA, uh, one slide fixed and one slide unfixed. And you can ask from the NHLS if you're lucky they've got, um, so if you get some, a lot of fluid, you're going to send that for gene expert. If you only get cells, then you can get these little bottles you can order from the NHLS. They've got Middlebrook TV culture in them, and sometimes they do have them here at our NHL is there, or you can put in one of those brown top gene expert uh, CSF tubes, you can put a mill of saline. And what you basically do is you rinse your needle in that. Um, and Dr. Seth was saying that one with the saline, you can actually send for gene expert, which was quite, so you can get a very quick result of that, or you can also send that for, for culture. If there is any signs possibly of TBN, so basically anybody with TB symptoms and some confusion, then you want to do an LP as well. And when you send your LP, do send enough fluid for gene expert and a separate one, you know, a separate one for gene expert, a separate tube for TB culture. And you're going to be very grateful for that later on in case um, your patient's not responding to treatment. So Mr. J, so this is now Thursday. So Monday, remember we saw him, we took all those bloods. If he had a very wet cough, we might've given him an antibiotic, but actually there was, please don't give antibiotics to people unless there's a clear indication. He's also got some diarrhea. So we've just put him on some, some Bactrim and his blood has come back. He's got a HP of 7.5, that's normocytic. He's got a CRP of 35 and he's got an ALT of 76, an ALP of 234 and a gamma GT of 302. So those two are both above the upper limit of normal. You're out in the district on a CHC. So you've got no easy access to ultrasound. There's no glands to put a needle in. Okay, would you? Now, would anybody start TB treatment today? Dr. Yassimi will start TB treatment, so now the rest of the group will follow. <laughs> so it's also this thing of you can't wait too long. So we don't have anything that confirms TB yet, but if you look at that picture, there's some inflammation going on somewhere. He's got anemia, he's got <laughs> loss of weight, he's got a low CD4 count in a country with high prevalence, and there's even something on ALP and gamma GT. In our setting, we would ask Pierre to get an ultrasound for us, or we'll get an ultrasound from the department just to confirm for us. But at this point, probably you can't wait any longer and hope you're going to find some other confirmation of TB. So although we don't have any clear confirmation in our setting in South Africa, we'll probably start TB treatment at this point. 
So we start him on Mr. J on River 4, and we're going to try and send a relevant mm -hmm. specimen for TB culture. He doesn't have any fluids or things we can F and A. So if you've got, especially if you've got a positive urine lamb, which he hasn't, but it's still worth a try also for the same reason that you can get positive lambs, is that if you send an early morning urine for TV culture in disseminated TB, it's about a 30% yield and you might actually get a culture result back. So that's something Dr. State likes to do in the internal medicine department. Um, and that's worth it just as, as, a, as a sort of a backup. So we've actually made an empirical TB diagnosis of TB and you need to note that clearly. And we need to watch him clearly to see whether he's going to respond. So can we relax? Got a diagnosis? No, we now need to keep going, right? So we've looked at the pulmonary, we've looked for extra pulmonary TB, but we need to make sure that he does not have a neurological thing going on um, as well. Um, and just a few basic things, whereas we know if the CD4 is under 100, no, it's 200 now, have they definitely changed it? Can anybody tell me? So there was a national circular that they've put the CD4 reflex testing up to 200. And I am not sure if that's what they're doing at our laboratory. Not sure. So, as far, so they, we, most people with a positive crag is going to be at a CD4 under 100. But we know that up to 150, actually, they are still the odd person you will find with a positive crag. And so I know they wanted to put up the threshold of the reflex testing, but we'll check whether that's actually happened. Um, the other thing is, is that if you are doing a, an LP and you do a gene expert on an LP, even a trace gene expert is then significant. So we know that the gene expert is very, very sensitive, right? And you can even just pick up a few dead bacilli. So if you've got somebody who's asymptomatic and you do a gene expert and you get a trace, I would take that with a pinch of salt. We would watch those. But your CSF is supposed to be sterile. So if a gene expert comes back trace on a CSF, that is confirmation of TBM. Um, and then, of course, in some scenarios, we want to do a CT scan before we LP. But actually, there's not that many scenarios where that is important. So for, even with cranial nerve palsies, we can still do a meningitis, a, a CT, if they're slightly uh, an LP. If they're slightly confused, we can still do an LP. It's only where they've got a coma or a GCS of less than 10, or obviously, obvious papilledema um, when you look in the eyes. If there's obviously a new local neurological deficit, or they've got a first seizure ever in an HIV-positive patient, or if there's a history of a ventricular peritoneal strength. So those patients, you can't LP. But everybody else, you can LP. Um, and that's important if you're in a district setting because you're not going to have easy access to those CT scans. So the chapter in the Advanced HIV Guidelines was written by Dr. Tom Boyles, and it's a very nice practical approach. Um, and basically, we normally, the symptoms that um, makes us very suspicious is any two of fee fever, headache, neck stiffness, or confusion. So this is a sick patient who's got any two of those. We're going to think of meningitis. And what's interesting is he divides them into what he calls acute meningitis and subacute or chronic meningitis. And we don't always think of these two different groups, but they're actually two completely different sets of organisms. So for acute meningitis, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on acute meningitis because this is really easy to diagnose. So these patients come in very sick and they're the nice classic, you know, stiff necks and very high fevers. Um, you're obviously going to get your LPs and blood cultures on down very quickly. You're going to start on your KIF and, and if they are elderly or immunocompromised, you're going to start them on some ampicillin as well. Um, and you're going to admit those patients very quickly. And those are our typical uh, bacteria, viruses or fungi that can cause an acute meningitis picture. But they're easy to diagnose, they're easy to identify, and they're usually relatively easy to get onto treatment and you know when to admit them. The tricky ones are what they call the chronic or the subacute meningitis. And this is where our HIV patients with the low CD4 counts are very vulnerable. So we're all very aware of tuberculosis. You can see they're under bacterial uh, and mycobacterial tuberculosis we're very aware of. But syphilis and listeria can both be problems. So listeria also in your very compromised patients. Yeah. We all know about cryptococcus in the brain, but you can get candida or aspergillus and your CD4 counts of under 50. So you get, get some, very, some very strange organisms. We often forget about some of your viral meningitis like herpes of the brain, zoster of the brain, CMV of the brain. And I think a lot of these patients, while we don't diagnose them as they come in very sick, 
you do the LP and the LP, you can see there's meningitis, but it's very nonspecific and your patient passes away before you've even properly started treatment. And a lot of these patients simply don't get diagnosed. These are patients who die of end stage age and you're not even aware of which organisms was actually, was actually there. Because remember your normal LP is not going to pick up uh, things like herpes, for example. And then of course you can get toxoplasmosis of the brain. Those we see more often, but there's various other weird and interesting um, parasites that can also go to the brain. So the problem is also when these patients present, um, they don't present with your classic meningitis signs. They might just be a bit confused or a bit apathetic and they just look sick. So these are patients obviously which you're going to LP and it's very important when you do your LP is send for as much as you can. So take enough bottles, be patient. You can't drain too much really, Dr. Kay's got a lovely presentation on how much uh, CSF you can safely drain. And it's, tr trust me, we do a fraction of the amount that we can actually drain. So don't feel frightened to, to take enough. Firstly, you need to be able to do a CSF opening pressure. Who here has done opening pressures on LPs or seen one done? Oh, well done. Okay, good. Great. You guys are getting the... Uh, we actually have been busy making a video, which I still need to post with Dr. Cumley, where he demonstrates... So it's lovely if you've got a manometer. If you don't have a manometer, then you're going to use your HR, your, your drip, drip set, your normal drip giving set. And remember, you just measure the, the vertical column and you add another six centimeters to that vertical column. Um, and it's important because the problem with your, your cryptococcus is, especially if you get your cryptococcus irises, because sometimes that initial CD4 gets missed, um, they quite often die before you even get your CSF results back. So a uh, high intracranial pressure is an early sign of cryptococcal meningitis. It's a very late sign for your other uh, subacute chronic, like TBM is only going to give increased pressure very, very late in the disease. So if you've got somebody where you do the pressure and it's high, you can start them on your treatment for uh, cryptococcal meningitis while you wait for that CSF results. You're obviously going to do protein, and if it's very high, it's bacterial. It's low and sometimes if it's normal or around 1.5, it could still be TBM. Glucose, a low glucose is um, quite often due to TBM, but just check what your serum glucose is doing because a lot of these cachectic patients are actually quite hypoglycemic. Gram stain is not always that useful, but do add in your gram stains and your bacterial cultures. Uh, cell counts, again, with your very low CD4 counts, don't rely on them too much to make a diagnosis. They could actually be sterile in somebody with HIV. You're obviously going to do your CRAGs and your syphilis. Very important to send both a gene expert as well as a TB culture on that sample. So this is interesting, something that they suggest um, is to store up to 10 mil of CSF. And I must find out if our NHLS actually can do this at all. But this is a recommendation, obviously, in private on which you can then ask for a viral PCR panel if you wanted to. So the viral PCR panels are quite expensive. So that's when you're looking for herpes or varicella or CMV of the, of the, of the brain, um, or for things like Listeria. But you might have a patient with meningitis and then when you start them on treatment, maybe you think it's TBM, there's no crack, crack's negative, there's something going on, they're not responding to treatment and then you might want to be able to not have to do another LP. So sometimes you'll have patients where you have to give empiric treatment. So sometimes you can see on the LP, there's some signs of meningitis, but it doesn't confirm what kind of meningitis, your gene expert's negative. About 10% of patients early on with TBM will have a normal LP. So again, because they're not making inflammation, you might not see anything on the LP and it might develop over time. So sometimes the LP might have changes later on. So it's worthwhile if your patient's got TB symptoms and um, you're concerned about TBM that you might start treatment uh, as a TBM anyway. There is a question whether if you've got people with very low CD4 counts, who's very sick with meningitis, and again, you're not finding a clear organism whether you shouldn't just add in a little bit of treatment for herpes simplex anyway. Um, and the same for, for neurosyphilis. And then if you've got patients who are very elderly or very immune compromised, you want to make, want to add in some ampicillin for Listeria as well, because that's not going to show up on your, on your um, MCNS. So in any patient who's very sick, you want to have a high index if they've got any neurological or mental symptoms. So remember, this guy was very apathetic. So apathetic, it's very difficult to then sometimes telling if they're actually confused. 
or not. And so we did do an LP um, in this person because if you, even though we've started TB treatment, if he's got TBM, we're going to give the regimen for much longer. But the lumbar puncture in Mr. J was normal, and we'll keep an eye on how he responds to treatment. Great. So we've done the first three systems. You all still with me? I'm not going to talk a lot about renal because that's a whole chapter in its own, but just to remember a lot of our patients will either or we will have some renal abnormality, most commonly just because of an acute kidney injury. So they're quite dehydrated, they might be quite septic, they're going to have a little bit of strain, but some of them might already have some chronic kidney disease, for example, from the HIV directly like in a high van. So there's also some um, nice information on that in that guideline. But in our patient has also had a bit of diarrhea, remember? And about 40 or 80% of your patients infected with HIV um, who's not on art is going to have diarrhea at some point. And the worry is, is that it's actually a frequent cause of admissions, but also has significant mortality. So the patient have, might have a multitude of different illnesses, but what actually kills them is the fact that they're vomiting or not drinking enough or the diarrhea, and they actually come in and they're dying of electrolyte um, abnormalities. And our definition in the world of diarrhea is we have acute, which is less than two weeks, and chronic, which is more than two weeks. So anything you investigate, yeah, more than two weeks, you're going to investigate. And what I love about the guideline is that um, Dr. Stead actually wrote this chapter, and he um, very nicely gives this being able to differentiate between whether it's small bowel diarrhea or large bowel diarrhea. And these tables are all directly out of the guideline because it can give you a clue on what kind of organism it is. And I think that's really useful. So small bowel diarrhea, as is an enteritis, is those large volume, very watery stools, very bland in nature. They might even have some malabsorption and they will have quite often have nausea and vomiting. And this is the common picture that we see with our yeah. HIV patients with severe HIV related diarrhea. And they're often apyrexial. Your large bowel, bowel diarrhea, your colitis, those are the low volume frequent stools. There might be some red and white cells. They might have tenesmus um, and they may be pyrexial and even have some left fossa, um, iliac fossa tenderness. So they're two very different pictures. And then what's great is he's got tables of the organisms which causes which I think is very clever. So, for example, um, your protozoa, and in our scenario, Cryptosporidium and Cystospora is the, probably the most common ones we see, but we do see Microsporidae as well, that's your worms, um, and very occasionally we see some amoebiases, um, and the protozoa all gives those small bowel diarrhea, except for amoebiases. I'm definitely not an infectious disease person. Mm -hmm. So... Um, the, and you can see that they're not always that easy to diagnose. You have to ask for it specifically. So when you do your stool MCNS, you're going to ask for stool MCNS over and parasite. So they can go and look for these. And notice that your mycobacterium, your TB of the gut and your MAC of your gut is also going to give a small bowel diarrhea picture. <laughs> your bacteria, on the other hand, your classic dysentery, like your salmonellas and your shigellas and your campylobacter or your clostridiums caused by antibiotic use, all of those actually give you a large bowel picture. And we actually see these much less commonly. And then interestingly, your viral CMV, more of a large bowel picture as well, where your typical HIV enteritis. So HIV enteritis is usually somebody with a very low CD4 count and you've excluded every other cause um, and their diarrhea is resistant to any other, even when they're on, and that, even when it's usually patients not yet on art, and usually the art sorts that out quite, quite nicely. And that's also a small bowel diarrhea. And then, of course, don't forget that your lipinavir ritonavir can cause diarrhea, um, and there are malabsorption syndromes that might be the problem as well. But also, if you've got Kaposi of the gut, or even your non Hodgkin's lymphomas can also cause diarrhea. So you've got quite a wide picture to. So what do we do? So most of the patients we see are these profuse watery diarrheas, and we're going to go look for isosporiasis and cryptosporidiosis. When the CD4 is low, we really want to start worrying about CMV and MAC. And very important, because it's this very watery diarrhea coming from the upper part of the gut, you're going to need to at least send at least three samples three days in a row to be lucky enough to get the organism. So watch out for the one bottle only. Give them three forms with three forms and get them to pick, drop off three, three samples. Um, and for all of these, art is going to be your most important intervention. So this is what we basically do. So if they've got diarrhea for more than two weeks, you're going to do a stool MCNS, 
and you're going to check um, for a modified oromin stain or for cocodian parasites. But if you write stool MCNS plus OVA plus parasites, they will do everything you want. If they've been having lots of antibiotics, then you'll have to specifically ask for Clostridium difficile. Okay, so if then if the clinic's already been treating them on antibiotics, then you just want to check for that as well. And remember your three samples. If they don't, if the samples come back negative and you haven't found the cause. Um, sometimes people do an abdominal ultrasound at this point, but actually, unless you're suspecting disseminated TB, it's not particularly useful for workup for diarrhea. They need to be scoped. And we are not very good at referring patients with scope. So what quite often happens in the clinics is they get keep on treating, you know, leperamide, 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 leperamide. Maybe somebody sends a stool MCNS, it's negative, leperamide, leperamide, leperamide. And of course, as we now know, there's various things you're not going to find unless you biopsy. You're not going to find that CMB of the gut or Kaposi of the gut or one of those weird colitis unless you go and biopsy. And what's interesting is then it depends on the kind of diarrhea you have. So for large bowel, you want your flex flexible sigmoidoscopies going to a full colonoscopy. But with your small bowel diarrheas, you're going to actually go the top way and you're going to start with a gastroscopy and a duodenal aspirate. So it's quite important to differentiate the two. Generally, what I find is the small bowels, we normally find what's going on on the MCNSs. So they usually we pick up, oh, it's isosperiosis or whatever. It's the large bowel ones where I think we have the challenge because that's where you have that Kaposi and, and CMB of the gut. So we did a stool MCNS on uh, Mr. J and sure, it came back as Sister Isispora Bele. And for that, we treated with Bactrim four tablets twice a day for 10 days. So it's a bit less than the PJP diagnosis. And it usually works very well. Um, but you do sometimes get patients with resistant isospora. And there's a whole lovely section on that in the guidelines if you got end up having a patient where you're struggling. Very important as part of your management of any of these patients, and that's not just from the diarrhea point of view, but also from the TB point of view. So if you've got a dietitian, especially during that first time, first few weeks while they're on TB treatment, um, and especially if you've got them on ARVs as well, they're going to use a lot of energy to fight this TB. And so they need a lot more energy or they're going to lose weight. And we see a lot of irises, TB irises, where the only thing you see is they drop their weight even further. So they come in with 48 kilograms and they drop it to 38 kilograms. Not good. So we want them to eat extra, but usually they don't have appetite. They might have sores in the mouth. They don't feel like eating. Um, and so one of my favorite things is most of our patients like mass, which is like a superfood, it's got fat in it, it's got protein in it. Um, you can also use yogurt for people who don't particularly like the mass. In this scenario, you're allowed to spoon in six spoons of sugar in your, in your mass. Um, and it's got a very nice combination of protein, carbs, and fat. And you want them to have one glass extra per day. So when the, the dietitians give kilojoule boosting, they usually give 500 extra kilojoules a day um, and calories a day. Um, and three glasses of mass a day is roughly 500 calories a day. So that's some supplementation you can do in a district level setting. And they must have it over and above their normal food. Great, we're getting towards the end. So there's just a couple of other things we haven't spoke, spoken about. So the one is that your patient who comes in with TB symptoms and heart symptoms. So they've got like a raised GV, JVP and maybe the heart sounds are quite muffled. And um, if there's a pericarditis picture with TB symptoms, TB pericarditis pericarditis is, is remarkably common in our area. We actually get written up in the Eastern Cape for our TB pericarditis. Um, and you diagnose it with TB symptoms and an x-ray. So if you're out in the district, you don't need to have a, an aspirate. An aspirate, for example, you do your ECG. If you've got that nice globular heart and it's not constrictive, then you can actually manage it in a district section. It'd be nice to get an echo. And again, we would love to teach you guys to be able to do echoes in the districts. But if they don't have a restrictive, constrictive picture, then you can manage them actually. And we're just going to put them onto normal TB treatment. Um, but probably for, we usually, I would like to treat them usually for nine months rather than the six months. And also under the cardiovascular, please examine your patients from top to bottom and just make sure they don't have a DVT under there as well, because this is the kind of patients who are so sick, the last thing they're going to complain about is the fact that they've got a sore or swollen cough. Um, and you don't want to miss that along the way. And then lastly, as part of your examination, always check the skin. Um, I was once, we were once sent a patient in Kobela that was admitted with TB. And then when we undressed him and examined them, we discovered they had like severe, thick and disseminated Kaposi of both legs. 
And his TB was actually probably secondary to the fact that he had cancer, but they found the TB on the gene expert and he looked sick. So he came to us and everybody missed the fact that he had severe disseminated Kaposi syndrome, Kaposi. Um, and then of course, if you look in the mouth, that's a nice picture of Kaposi of the hard palate. And some patients, as I said, 15% of patients might not have any Kaposi on the skin, but can have Kaposi of the gut. And if they've got Kaposi of the palate, you can be fairly sure they've got Kaposi of the gut. So it gives us a bit of a, a picture of systemic. Um, and of course, oral candidiasis is almost ubiquitous in these patients and need to be treated. And then, yeah, just check for that. Any nodular or suspicious lesions on the legs or in parts of the body that nobody might have been looking. So when do you refer up if you're in a district or a CHC sitting? So ex at firstly, if you don't have a diagnosis, you've got to send them up the line for investigations because there's some things you can't do. So say they've got a pancytopenia or they've got a really bad anemia. You've started them on TB treatment. Their TB seems to be getting better, but their anemia is not improving. They might have a parvovirus and you might have to send them up for a bone marrow biopsy. Patients who might have focal lesions, they might have focal neurology, for example, you're going to need a CT scan to look for that toxoplasmosis or TBM. Remember, we talked about scopes. So if you've got patients with chronic diarrhea where you're not managing, you're going to refer them up for a scope so we can find out what's going on. And sometimes your FNAs are very nonspecific and you've got a large gland and you can't tell if you're lymphoma or TB or what's going on. Um, and then you might need to get a proper lymph node biopsy done. But also if you've got somebody where you think you know what's going on and you've put them on treatment, especially these very sick patients and they're not responding to treatment, I would refer those up pretty much quickly as well. But similarly now, what you might be treating, you might be not, you, know, you, it, you might be treating this uh, pneumonia, but actually there's a very atypical organism in the back or you might be treating this diarrhea, but actually there's something else that's going on. So if you made a diagnosis, but your patient's not responding, send them earlier rather than later. Um, because they've got this very high risk of mortality. So in summary, when you start off, you look always for TB and your respiratory OIs. Then you're going to go and look for any extra pulmonary TB if, there's, if you don't find anything there. Check if your kidneys are all right. Always wonder about sepsis. Check your neurological system because that's going to kill your patient very quickly. Go see what's going on with the abdominal system and watch out for your skin and your mucous membranes and, of course, about other STIs. Thank you very much, everybody. I hope this has just given you a taste of what is actually out there in that guideline. I haven't gone into detail um, into any of the chapters. And I think they're actually great because all of them gives a very good approach to actually any infectious disease workup of any of these systems. And they're very worthwhile spending some time with. Thank you very much. I'm going to open the floor for questions. Um, also, for those of us that joined us online, please do feel free to post questions in the chat or to put your hand up. Any questions or comments from the floor? You have to come forward and speak into the speaker. Microphone. And Dr. Fuentes, yes. Thank you very much for the presentation. I just want uh, on the, to clarify something because usually when we are looking for TB in the mm -hmm. high needle aspiration, we don't send the slide for a AFB because we no. have the gene expert. Mm -hmm. So you usually we do the slides only when you're looking for malignancy that you send for cytology. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Great. So, so yes. So if you are able to send those cells for gene expert. Or culture that's that's very useful um you're right for malignancy is quite helpful so quite often people don't have the middlebrook medium or don't know the saline trick so then we've traditionally been putting but you're quite right if you're able to get cells and you're able to send them for gene expert and make sure your local lab can do that um that's that's worth a while my worry is sometimes if the gene expert fails then it's still very satisfying to be able if they actually see bacilli on the slide then you at least have that as so some confirmation yeah, well, I mean, the AFB, I mean, this is just a, yeah, it's just a smear. No, definitely. No, you definitely need to send the gene expert if you can at all. But I agree with you. If you've got limited resources as well, um, then you can send those cells. And certainly if you get a lot of fluid, then your priority is not to put it on a slide. If you get like a whole lot of skunk out of a gland, then please just send it for gene expert and send it for culture. It's only when you've got those dry glands where you're only getting a few cells 
um, that you would make a slide and then rinse your needle in something to send for a gene expert. Thank you, yeah, that's practical. Any other questions or comments? Just gonna check the chat. Um, can I just ask those of you that are present in the meeting on Zoom to please put your details in the chat, just your name um, and your registration number, your, uh, and then that'd be for CPD purposes, thank you. Okay, I don't see any other questions here. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, for those of you online, I'm going to give you a little bit of time just to please put your details into the chat for us. So I won't, I won't log off immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and we are going to be recording this and be available on YouTube so that you can disseminate um, to colleagues for those that will find that useful. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a lovely day.